Today, I welcome the new batch and the returning batches of the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication, the sixth school of this young university that dares to dream. You are passionate, curious, rebellious, and a humanist. That's why you chose to be here today. Whether you are in the film and new media program or the journalism and media studies, my commencement plea to you is look for innocuous incidents to explain the democratic conundrums because India can only be understood through these conundrums. How should we live together? Find out how the majorities have dealt with minorities, with genocide, with exclusion. Hurt, damaged, but not defeated by a pandemic and its aftermath with tumultuous political developments at home and abroad. The question then is, how are we going to build the rules of co-living amidst confusions and disruptions? Let us unpack the conundrum so that we can find the moral argument. Before I request my founding Vice Chancellor, Professor Raj Kumar, to make his keynote address online, because now we've come to, the, to live in a world where we are hybrid, I want to thank my faculty and everyone present here for upholding the values of humanity and fighting against impossible odds to look out for each other in the community. Uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all our uh, students who are joining us. Uh, I would like to congratulate the students uh, of the BA Honours in Journalism and Media Studies and the BA Honours in Film and New Media who have joined the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. Uh, it is indeed our proud privilege to welcome each one of you to the campus. Um, I feel, um, uh, you know, I, I'm so sorry that I'm not there with you physically, but there are some reasons uh, which I will tell you shortly uh, because of which I'm here in Delhi. Uh, but it's also a very special moment for a number of reasons. Before I do that, I want to extend a warm welcome to uh, one of India's most extraordinarily inspiring journalists, uh, Mr. P. Sainath. Uh, I'm so sorry that uh, I'm not there to formally and physically welcome you, uh, sir. It's such a pleasure to see you, and thank you for taking the time out um, to, uh, to welcome, uh, uh, to be present while you welcome our own students as they uh, join the Jindal School, of, uh, Interna uh, Jindal School of Journalism and Communication. Now, for all the students here, uh, I should tell you that uh, one of the things that you should immediately do, uh, you know, as, as you begin your academic journey, is to pick up a book uh, which is entitled Everybody Loves a Good Drought, Stories from India's Poorest Districts. Uh, I believe in uh, 2000, uh, it's, it was published in the year 2000, uh, around the same time, and uh, probably... It's over 20 years. And this book is, uh, of course, uh, one of the most uh, inspiring books that I've ever read in my life. And uh, the author of it is none other than Mr. Sainath himself. In, in a way, at a time when uh, the larger interest of media in general has been to focus on issues that are of concern to mostly privileged people, uh, Mr. Sainath has spent a good part of his life uh, you know, looking at issues that are of concern for the people who are voiceless, who are marginalized, who are disempowered, and whose stories need to be told in brought to the larger public domain. Um, now, let me say why today is special for us. Of course, it is special for the first reason that uh, we are welcoming our uh, journalism students. It's also special because we are celebrating the International Day of Peace. The United Nations uh, uh, celebrates uh, and declares this day as the International Day of Peace. And uh, we also pay tribute to uh, numerous people across the world and, of course, in our country who have um, uh, stood for uh, the fulfillment of the ideals of uh, achieving peace. And peace, as you know, is not about absence of war, but actually the conditions that exist in society where uh, you know, people, all people are able to pursue and help in fulfilling their larger uh, aspects of 
civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. The third reason, of course, uh, which we are uh, also celebrating is that today we uh, had a very important uh, announcement by uh, one of India's top lawyers by name, Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi, who instituted an endowment uh, in this university, who will be the first person outside the general family to have instituted the endowment, which will provide opportunities for a lot of students who may not be able to afford education at Jindal for them to study here at our university. Now, coming back to this commencement lecture itself, um, all I can say is that when we started the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication, our vision was to do three things. One, to elevate the study of journalism uh, to the status of an independent, autonomous, pedagogical approach towards the study of journalism with a strong focus on uh, liberal arts, humanities, and social sciences into the curriculum of the study of journalism. Uh, as you will appreciate that there are journalism schools uh, or, or institutes and institutions which provide the study uh, relating to journalism, where most of which is focused on skill sets that one needs to acquire to become an effective journalist, as opposed to studying the foundations of many aspects of humanities and social sciences, which will enable you, empower you, to ultimately become an, a, a journalist. The second reason we started the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication was to recognize the role of journalists uh, and those who are in a position to speak truth to power with a view to helping strengthen our democratic institutions and fulfilling the ideals of constitutionalism and rule of law by the work of journalists. This particular aspect of the work of journalists is going to be extremely difficult and challenging and every society goes through its own uh, share of challenges and there is no better time than as we celebrate the 75th year of Indian independence we become even more conscious, conscious of the need to empower uh, our journalists so that they are in a position to speak truth to power and they are able to make power holders accountable in numerous ways. The third reason why we started the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication is that we were indeed uh, disappointed at some levels with the larger framework of uh, yeah, what extent training and capacity building is taking place within the uh, journalism schools or for that matter other training that happens for journalists to become uh, effective uh, public intellectuals in the sense that contributed to that voice that was much needed in our democracy. Uh, this was, of course, a larger agenda. And I do believe that uh, not only journalists, but also many others, uh, many other uh, you know, professionals who are part of our institution will be playing that role, including, for example, uh, the law graduates and lawyers who have a very big role to play. But the point I want to say is that uh, uh, just before the pandemic, if we were um, uh, rather uh, concerned about the future of journalism as a profession, if we were concerned about whether journalists uh, or journalism as a profession that we understood before would be relevant, all of that was uh, put to rest. Uh, because if you just imagine for a moment in March 2020 onwards, when the entire world came to a standstill, it was the journalists across the country and around the world who brought the much needed uh, news and accurate information into our own rooms when we were all closeted and simply were maintaining that social distance that we were all used to. It was the brave journalists of the world who were uh, taking enormous personal risks and ended up reporting information at a time when we were all groping in the dark when it comes to minimum basic accurate information. So those, um, you know, the warriors of Corona, I would call them as no less important than the healthcare professionals. They played a, a human service when it comes to bringing that much needed information to our own rooms. So now as we enter into a post pandemic world, we will be continuing to face the big issues of public health, 
international peace and security, issues surrounding environment and climate change, and all the rest that will not only be faced by India, but also around the world. But we will also be facing issues that are pertinent to our own context, which may include strengthening our democratic institutions, to what extent those institutions are functioning in an independent manner, to what extent governments, both state and central, can be made accountable for their actions, to what extent independent media be not influenced either by the government of the day exerting pressure on them or by corporations and companies and business enterprises which have significant stakeholdership in them which influences what ends up becoming news. The democratization of the news space is also something that has created new opportunities for young people like you who will become future journalists. And so I am confident that as we look at the future, I'm even more sanguine about the possibility of strengthening these democratic institutions. That promise and that optimism that I've held uh, is largely because of the fact that um, while we are uh, 1.4 billion people, uh, the reality is uh, nearly 900 million people of our country are less than 35 years of age. And that includes all the students who have joined the General School of Journalism and Communication. I believe you are going to be shaping the future, not just of India, but also the world at large. And what we hope to do in the years to come while you are here is to provide the knowledge, the expertise, the skills, and most importantly, the thought process that will help you uh, to be able to uh, challenge status quo and seek change. Uh, you, can, you may do that by becoming a journalist, but at the end of the day, you may also be able to do that by pursuing other careers and professions, including graduate degrees in India or abroad, in so many other disciplines, that has been the case with many outstanding journalists. I also want to mention that uh, this university grew in a very modest manner with only 100 students and 10 faculty members and one school in the year 2009 when we established the Jindal Global Law School. And in 10 days when we will be celebrating our uh, 13th anniversary, today we have grown into a multidisciplinary university with 12 schools, including a business school, a school of international affairs, a school of government and public policy, a school of liberal arts and humanities, a school of journalism and communication, a school of art and architecture, a school of banking and finance, a school of environment and sustainability, a school of psychology and counseling, a school of languages and literature, and most recently, a school of public health and human development. Now, quite remarkably, all these disciplines are having strong relationship to uh, the study of journalism and media studies. And I sincerely hope that besides the core and elective courses that you will be studying within your school, the, you will also take up elective courses across all other schools and programs, uh, which an opportunity of which uh, JGU provides abundantly to you, and I hope you will make the best use of it. Um, lastly, I want to say that uh, this year is an important transition for us, as uh, we've had a fantastic tenure by the uh, founding dean of the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication, Professor Tom Goldstein, who earlier was the dean of the journalism schools at both Berkeley and Columbia. And uh, in the early phase of our growth and evolution, he not only helped in establishing the school, but saw through the first graduating batch of the students and saw through the pandemic years. And today we are in a very good situation where the mantle of leadership of the school is now being ably uh, led by Professor uh, Kishalai Bhattacharya and all his faculty members. I want to thank um, uh, the leadership and thank and appreciate the contribution of Professor Kishalai Bhattacharya and all his faculty members who have worked tirelessly hard, not only uh, to educate and empower and mentor our students of journalism, but also to enable you to pursue meaningful careers in the field of uh, media, but also outside as well. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Professor uh, Upasana Mahata and her team and colleagues who were involved in the admissions process, which has ultimately uh, led to bringing all of you onto campus. Uh, I would like to conclude by saying that being part of a residential campus has its own uh, opportunities to have a holistic life experience, make the best use of it. Uh, you are part of that institutional ecosystem whereby not only what happens in classroom is important, but also what happened outside the classroom is equally important, and I hope you will make the best use of it. With those words, I would like to uh, once again 
congratulate each uh, student uh, who has joined the journalism school, but also welcome back all the faculty members and also in particular thank and appreciate Mr. Saida not only for his uh, presence uh, to deliver the commencement lecture, but also his lifelong contribution towards what I have elsewhere mentioned as speaking truth to power with integrity and gracefulness. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Raj. Now, I don't want to come. I know you guys have come here to listen to Saina. Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to introduce him. You, everyone knows Saina just like everyone loves a good drought. Everyone loves a good Saina talk. Uh, and I'm going to um, request my colleague Saba Nagvi, who has known Sainath for a very long time, uh, to introduce Sainath. But let me tell you something that 42 years ago, um, yesterday, was when Sainath actually joined journalism. Uh, and he was brought into journalism by a former colleague of mine, a very dear colleague who we all lost, called Appan Menon. Uh, since then, which has been a long time. In 42 years, Sainath has won more than 60 awards, including the Max S.A. Award, but he's also declined many awards, including one of India's uh, uh, top award, the Padma Bhushan, India's third highest civilian awards, as he believes journalists should never accept prizes and rewards from governments they cover and critique. In 2021, he declined the rupees 1 million YSR award from the government of Andhra Pradesh. Um, and I thought those were important for you to know, rather than the number of awards that he's received. Um, but Sabha, if I may ask you to quickly introduce uh, Sainath before he delivers the commencement uh, address. I have nothing very much to say. Everybody knows who Sainath is. In a journalism school, all of you, the young students, the ones who have joined this year, are going to be told to read Everybody Loves a Good Drought again and again. All of you who are already here are already checking out the People's Archive of Rural India. And that is also Sainath's uh, work. And, uh, and very soon, you're going to get a book, the second book from Sainath, which is going to be the story of the freedom, str uh, freedom struggle fighters. And you're going to hear a lot about that book. I'll just go back to one personal anecdote. Sainath is, in my view, arguably, not even arguably, in my view, he is the best journalist India has had. Simply, <laughs> simply because journalism is not just covering politicians, sitting in studios, arguing about it. I myself have spent a lot of time covering politics. But Sainath does the journalism that I, I admire. He has gone to the field and covered Indian people. And he, he knows more about the journalism at the very beginning of how it should be, telling the stories of the people of India. No one does it better than Sainath. And Sainath will not remember this, but when I was a young journalist and when I first met him, he, it, I think the year would be 97. Today, over lunch, I asked him, when was Everybody Loves a Good Drought published? And he said, 97, 98. There was this heroic journalist who we were already looking up to. We were all much younger. Sainath was younger. And he had a manuscript in his hand. <laughs> he remembers. And he gave it to me. And it was the manuscript before it was published of Everybody Loves a Good Drought. And then the book came out, and it was a sensation. I mean, it's a must-read book. And Sainath, you know what you've written there that time, all those years ago, when I got you to sign it? Sainath has written in my copy of the book, Saba, journalism is for readers, not for shareholders. P. Sainath. Welcome, P. Sainath. School and the organizers for inviting me here. And I thank the vice chancellor for some things he said in his opening remarks, when he I, I completely endorse the idea of why you need a journalism school, and what were the compulsions or, you know, pressures to start something different. It is also correct. I also noticed that he mentioned the role of journalists in the pandemic. Uh, you should know that up to. March this year, 
More than 720 journalists have died of COVID. We think that's an underestimate. It's put together by the unions, by the press clubs, and from many places, there is no data. Maharashtra has the most comprehensive, and it is 180 journalists. Now, most of them don't have accreditation cards and are not members of press clubs. These are rural journalists, some of whom were drawing, earning 4,000, 5,000 a month. And their families remain in bankruptcy because of the three to four lakhs spent on the medical care. Yeah. Uh, in the People's Archive of Rural India, we are, from a prize we won, are giving over 12 and a half lakhs so that 25 families get 50,000 rupees each of this kind of journalist who actually was on the front lines and try. But there's one thing, a clarification here. The Vice Chancellor very correctly said the role of journalists in the pandemic. I want to make sure that you understand that is entirely distinct from the role of media in the pandemic. These are two very dis different things. Journalism and the media may have been the same thing a hundred years ago, not now. The media played a very different role in the pandemic. Let me begin by telling you that in, uh, see, by journalists, we're talking about guys like us and you. By media, we're talking about institutions, co companies, corporates, conglomerates, owners, yeah, uh, profit-seeking institutions. And the day your lockdown was declared, the first lockdown, on the evening of, late evening of March 24th, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced that, you know, hey guys, you 1.4 billion of you, you have, I'm giving you four hours to shut down the country and try doing what you can to save your butts. So, uh, immediately after the speech, he, his government followed up with something that I was very supportive of. I was very happy that he did it. They put out a list of essential services that would be um, exempt from the, you know, bans and do's and don'ts of the pandemic. And essential services are, of course, treated, being treated as essential. Your jobs are protected. All of this happens. Media and journalism was amongst that, the media industry and journalists were in that list of essential services. And it felt very good that somebody in 2020 still thought of us as essential. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now that was supposed to protect jobs. It was supposed to see that the public got the and journalists tried doing what they could, at least some of us. Do you know that within a few months of the declaration of media as an essential service, hundreds of journalists were sacked by media corporations. Now that's the difference between media and journalists. In the, the Delhi Union of Journalists went to court over the sackings and the last press release put out by the Delhi Union of Journalists said at least 3,000 jobs, journalists in this country have lost their jobs. That is a press release of May 2022. Many more have lost their jobs since then. This is not because, not because the institutions were suffering. It was the richest institutions that did the biggest layoffs. Do you know what the value of the media industry in this country is? Any guesses? By the way, when we talk about media industry, we are talking about the media and entertainment industry because the two are the same thing. It, and it's very hard to, yeah, come on. I mean, you know, crime and entertainment are hugely overlapped, right? They're the biggest beats in the newspapers. And I mean, why do we cover Salman Khan's black buck case? Because it's a crime or because he is entertainment? <laughs> Why do we cover that? You know, there are th 100 to 200 journalists at the court on the day his case comes up. Yeah. 
Um, now the in as these as the owners took control, they were getting rid of rationalizing staff and personnel the way they had always intended to. Right? They were doing it. I mean, please remember that one newspaper, the HD and Telegraph, closed down six editions in 2017. So it's not just the pandemic. It, the pandemic provided an excuse. Remember that the same period, state after state in this country, starting with Gujarat and Uttar Pradesh, suspended 35 to 39 labor laws, including the Working Journalists Act. No pro on the one hand, we were being placed under essential services to be given protection so that we could do our duty towards the public. Not that I never know we did, but, uh, but we were given that protection. And yet, the media bosses, the conglomerate owners could sack 3,000 human beings. And there are many kinds of retrenchments that don't get counted under this. After the paid news scandal, the media created new ways of seeing that they could not be sued for retrenchments and other things. One of the things they did, pioneered, I think, by the HD, if I'm not mistaken, was a correspondent in Uttarakhand will give a letter to the newspaper. Uh, journalism is not my occupation. I pursue it as a hobby. Okay, so that when he is sacked, the newspaper has no accountability or anything towards him because he has signed a declaration saying I'm not a... They came, this came up before the press council where I'm a member of a committee looking at sackings and retrenchments. <laughs> and they are called hobby correspondents. <laughs> Some of them have been in journalism for 30 years. They're called hobby correspondents. Oh boy, what a hobby. I don't know which one is the hobby, the journalism or the management's sacking. You know, I think that's the greater hobby. Anyway, um, look, did your media even tell you that this year, the great tradition of Indian journalism, there are lousy traditions, there are great traditions, but did they tell you that Indian journalism, that for 160 out of 200 years, did something worthwhile? Did any of your newspapers or magazines or channels or anyone tell you that in April we completed 200 years as media of India? Yeah, the press in India completed 200 years. April 12, 2022 was the 200th anniversary. You know, in typically, sorry, forgive me, but in journalism schools and textbooks, we talk about Hickey's Gazette being the start of Indian journalism. Neither Hickey was Indian, nor was his journalism Indian journalism. He was concerned about the European community and the elite and who the governor's general's wife was flirting with. And occasionally, he got into fights with them and was heroic about it. Okay, But he was neither Indian, nor was his journalism Indian. April 12, 2022, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, launched Miratul Akbar. I'm sorry to deflate all my Bengali friends in the audience, but his publication was not in Bengali, it was in Persian. Yeah, it was in Persian, which was the language of the elite at the time. It was the language of the Mughal court, etc. But please, he didn't do it because he knew only Persian. He was a journalist who knew 10 languages. Though he didn't write in most of those, but he knew 10 languages. He, was, he thought himself French towards the end of his life and received acclaim for some things that he wrote from French critics. The very first or second edition of Miratul Akbar, I think in its first season, certainly, he, gave, he covered something which raises so many questions of contemporary relevance. By the way, from the day one, his journalism was about, you know, 
It was about ordinary people. It was about social reform. It was about sati. It was about uh, female infanticide. It was about the op re repression, destruction of many Indian educational things. He had all sorts of debates going with the colonial power on that. But one of the earliest editorials, front paged, was on the case of Pratab Narayan Das, a riot, I think, I'm not sure, I think he was a peasant, in Komila, now in Bangladesh. Okay? He was brought up on some trivial offense or something, and the great British canons of British justice and all that declared that he be flogged so many dozens of times for some, I don't even know what, very pedestrian offense. He died. Pratap Narayan Das died of the beating. Ram Mohan Roy wrote a front page editorial savaging that system of justice, savaging the, the judge of Komila, who was a very powerful judge. Komila was an important center. You know what happened? Three things happened. First, every major publication, including all the English publications, barring the great newspapers whom we now respect so much, reproduced that piece. James Buckingham, James Buckingham translated it into English with the help of Raja Ram Mohan Roy. And the highest court of Britain in India, at, remember at that time, this is prior to the crown, it's still East India Company. The judge of Komila was summoned before the Supreme Court of that time. What an impact! What an impact for a newspaper editorial. Yeah. Just think of Siddiqui Kappan having spent two years in prison with no charge, nothing brought against him in court and not given bail for two years. I mean, think about journalism then and media now. Hmm. Then, in retaliation against Raja Ram Mohan Roy, the third thing that happened, the Governor General brought the first set of what became famous in 1850s as the 1870s as the Vernacular Press Act. The predecessors of those were brought to curb and it, it targeted um, Miratul Akbar, it targeted the Sangbad, Kaumudi Sangbad, that other, other publication he began. And what did, what did Raja Ram Mohan Roy do? He shut down his paper with a front page editorial saying, I will not work and publish under such dehumanizing and degenerate conditions. Mm -hmm. He shut down the publication. He was actually quite a smart Bengali. And while saying, I'm shutting down the publication, shifted all the political content to Sangbad Kaumudi. Okay, and reached much bigger audiences because while Miratul Akbar was in an elite language, the other publications he started were in Bengali, reaching ordinary readers. So this was the beginning of the great tradition of Indian journalism. Who do you think were your great journalists? We'll come to that because I have, you know, Journalism is the, I was telling you what the value of your industry is. The projection for March 2024, just in time for the elections, is that the media and entertainment industry's value will be 2.32 trillion rupees. I don't know what 2.32 trillion rupees can do, but I know I can't fit 12 zeros in my head because that's what is a trillion. Hmm. 2.32 trillion rupees, the guys in the last, since the liberalization began, many of these publications, and many of these publication groups have grown by obscene percentage. Their growth percentages are literally obscene. Yeah. They are too closely locked to the market, to the government, to ever be able to tell you the real truth about anything. 
I think the, I think the Vice Chancellor was absolutely right in saying, you know, it should be the endeavor of every journalist to speak the truth to power. I would like to take it a little further than that. I'm not at all satisfied with that. You see, when we say, speak the truth to power, there is somehow an assumption of a very naive and innocent power, you know? They're going to say, hey, we didn't know that and correct it. That's not going to happen. They're the guys who did it. Your job, if you ask me, follow that principle, yes, speak the truth to power, but more important, speak the truth about power. Um, let me ask you two questions. By the way, you guys are going to be all journalists. Those of you who came, if you listened to a previous talk of mine and got the answer, don't spill the beans. Uh, let those, I'm a journalism teacher, too. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You know, we all know that we all joined with the uh, best of intentions and the greatest of ideas and Nobody ever joined the profession to do bad journalism, right? So the question arises, guys, I want an answer or two. What is good journalism? Not what your textbooks told you, not what your, uh, not what your, um, I don't need you to tell me, you, you don't need to be scared of your, that you have to say what your faculty told you. They're all old friends of mine. And I can always ask them independently what they told you. But I want to know what you think. What is good journalism? A couple of lines of an answer. What is, yeah. You know, what is an unbiased manner? Do you know of anyone who is totally unbiased? Okay, but I think... I think I have to come back to your class for a discussion on bias. Yeah. There's a difference between bias and prejudice. Reality can be very biased. You know, if I killed somebody, I killed him. You can't turn that around. I mean, that's, that's the truth, right? You can go into the questions of why I killed him, but that's, that's another matter. That's another discussion again. Uh, yeah, what is good journalism? Um, I feel good journalism is when you're reporting, your opinion should not affect the truth. Like she said, in an unbiased manner. So I feel unbiased is when you are not letting your opinion affect whatever you are representing or, you know, showing the truth. Okay. What happens if your opinion and the truth coincide? Sometimes I mean. Then you don't report at all, no? No. See, the thing is that if the thing is that if my opinion is affecting it, then that won't be the truth. It is sort of I'm manipulating. I take your point, but I'm saying, can it happen that your opinion and the truth coincide? Yeah. Because you, as a human being, form your opinion on the basis of what you believe to be the truth. Correct. So anyone else? What's good journalism? Yes. Uh, I think good journalism is essentially a call to action. It provokes the reader, right? It elicits emotion and it essentially tells you that you know you are not living in your own isolated world, okay. but it tells you of the other, essentially. By the way, let me let me reiterate that all three of you who have spoken, in large measure, I agree with all three of you. But I want to hear someone. I mean, I totally agree with what you said, but to, that not affecting, you can't shape truth to your opinion. That's a different matter. I agree with all of that. Anyway, but I want to say something about journalism. Okay. According to the principle, you have one you are reporting, so you can Yeah, I mean, you're rising above yourself and suppressing your baser instincts, so to speak, of projecting something you like. I was joking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So, yeah. So tell me, yeah. I'm listening. Yeah, I would, I would say what you're saying is a very powerful truth about any profession we work in. Right. Brings me back to, what do you think is good journalism? Yeah. Well, I, I, I see the truth of that also, that to, to be a good journalist, first you have to be a journalist, right? I agree with that. I keep wondering about people telling me, so-and-so is a progressive musician and a progressive singer. Now, if you've got a voice like a frog and can't sing to save your life, it doesn't matter how progressive you are. <laughs> so, uh, so that it, it, it doesn't really matter, does it? So you have to first be a good singer, okay. But what is good journalism? Yeah, more, I love this. Go on, yeah. Excellent, yeah. Anything else? I think, uh, here, here. Can you hear me? Sir, here. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I think uh, good journalism is when you're able to represent the cause of the people to the people in power. And then in case it's not redressed, then maybe... Uh, Ad advocacy journalism. Yeah, I mean, that. Yeah. No, but I... Please don't think I'm criti critiquing yeah, or criticizing that. Yeah. I do... I, I try to practice what you're saying. Okay, but... Anything else? Good journalism. Yeah. A little louder. Yeah, so, so I think that good journalism is just basically the art of good storytelling where you keep yourself above the story, you keep yourself above an issue and you sort of present uh, whatever you see in... I mean, again, like the idea of objectivity can be debated because like you said, I don't think that there's objectivity that exists as such because I don't think any individual is free from his or her bias. While picking a story also, you do exercise bias. So, I mean... That, yeah. Thank you. I think that you made one of the most important points about journalism is that it's a very important element is good storytelling. Why did you guys why did you guys like everybody loves a good drought? It tells you stories, doesn't it? Yeah. It doesn't give you the bulletin of the atomic energy department. It, it tells you a story. Right. But that is extremely important, and I think that is a very sensitive approach. Can we go a little further? And, and objectivity, I'm not going to get into that. That's another conversation. <laughs> uh, tell me. Anyone? Yes. Good journalism is good journalist is unafraid. Good journalism is to be unafraid. You've just demolished me as a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared out of my wits half the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi. So I think that um, good journalism involves not trying to be actively unbiased. Because when you try to actively be unbiased, you sort of show both the sides equally. Like, you portray them in equal strength. And sometimes, right. like, to give an example, um, people who are anti, who are against wearing masks, if there are, like, uh, nine people who, like, like right. nine reports that says you have to wear a mask, and one report that says 
it's fine. You shouldn't portray both of them equally. And I think trying to actively be unbiased, you yes, will portray them equally. You can add to the problem. And actually, you're getting out to a very important doctrinal issue of, you know, balance and balance and bias and equidistance and stuff. Many years ago when, and given 42 years, that was really many years ago, when I shared a platform with the venerable M.V. Kamath, he was on this line of equidistance. The truth is equidistance from opposing biases. Yeah, whatever is in the middle is normal. So laid down one of India's greatest journalists. So I suggested, I was a very young guy and uh, yeah, such a time existed. And, and I suggested to Mr. M.P. Kamath that we put his proposition to the test. That is, if we put Mr. Kamath's left hand in fire and right hand in ice, his body temperature should be about normal, you know. <laughs> from opposing extremes. He was equidistant from opposing extremes. He somehow didn't fancy the idea very much and declined to volunteer. But uh, important doctrinal thing, yeah. Uh, sir, I don't really have an uh, I don't really have a set definition, but I have an example of what I would consider good journalism. Uh, my uh -huh. parents know this journalist called uh, Parim Joy. So like he used to write about unethical business practices. Correct. Now, because you used to write against like the Adani group, for example, no newspaper or no publication wants him. Will anything. publish him. Yeah. Yes. So as a result, he set up an independent uh, news site and he still talks about all this. So to me, that would be like good journalism. Yeah. That even if the shareholders don't approve, you still tell the truth. Exactly. And I like very much, I like very much that you said, I'm not trying to define it. The job of a journalist you know, like I've been asked to, you know, you're covering all this stuff. Why don't you define poverty? It is not my job to define poverty as a journalist. It is my job to describe it faithfully. Yeah. And there are enough economists to do a horrible job of that, of that, uh, you know, of defining it. So let's leave it to them. I mean, you know, their stable, their pigsty, whatever, leave it to that. Yeah, anyone else? And then I'm going to wind this up. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one could approach it from what I said at the beginning. Nobody joins to do, nobody signs up to do bad journalism. So, yes. I like taking up from where he said, I'm not trying to define it for you. I'm going to suggest that the history of journalism, especially the history of Indian journalism, but I think globally, suggests that good journalism is that which engages with the great processes of its time. That is good journalism. Yeah. So if in our time, the pandemic, whatever it was. Hmm? Your greatest journalist, what did Raja, what made Raja Ram Mohan Roy great, though I disagree with him on a million things, he was engaging with the great processes of his time. Your greatest journalists were Gandhi, Ambedkar, and another name that would surprise you. But I mean, how many, how many journalists between them can claim to have 150 volumes of collected works, and some yet to be published in the case of Ambedkar. Hmm? They both opened and ran three journals, Gandhi and Ambedkar. There's plenty of bias in their writings. And that bias is not necessarily separate from truth. Hmm. 150, Gandhi alone, the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, which you can see on the thing, 100 volumes, the master of the one-liner of storytelling, Ambedkar, the most brilliant analytical journalism that you could dream of doing. Yeah. G great journalism engages with the great, good journalism is that which engages with the great process of its time. 
Yeah. And I'm not thinking of Salman Khan and Katrina Kaif. Yeah. Uh, let's say, the, I would say, the, if you're looking at the great processes of our time, I would say the unprecedented levels of inequality that India sees today. In two estimates. One estimate says last seen in 1921. Another says in the 1870s. You take your pick. All I can say is in our 70 years, 75 years, levels of inequality that have never been seen. How many of you have looked at the... What are we celebrating when we celebrate 75 years? I have no clue because no government website ever tells me that. You know, we're celebrating something very specific, something very important, something very... Have, how many of you have looked at the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahatsav website? By the way, did you find it, uh, told you anything about British colonialism? We got independence from British colonialism. And there were reasons why we stood up against British colonialism. In, very importantly, those levels of inequality, dehumanization, etc. Mm. And in 2022, your levels of inequality are right up there with 1921 and the 1870s, according to the boffins. Let me give you something, a little glimpse of your inequality as of it today. Every now and then you read celebratory pieces, the latest being, we were so thrilled that Gautam Adani became second richest man for six hours. <laughs> then horribly, he fell into the deadly poverty of being the third richest man. <laughs> yeah. Now, in 1991, India did not have, at least if they had, they were very quiet about it, a single dollar billionaire, not one. In 2008, I'm starting with 1991 because the levels of inequality, the reversal of, minima of reducing inequality, all this happens from then. 19, in two, year 2000, you had $8 billionaires. The numbers I'm throwing at you here are from Forbes.com, the particular page called ForbesBillionaires.com, my favorite website. I keep it pinned up, I mean, bookmarked, first bookmark in my computer because it tells me of capitalism's prom promise, you too can do it, <laughs> right? So, uh, incidentally, girls, I'm addressing girls. The Forbes billionaires list each year is published on March 8th, International Women's Day. Now, there are not many women in the list, but it's one of those aspirational things. <laughs> yeah? So that is, that is what it's all about. So the dollar billionaires were number 0, 91, 8, and 2000. 2012, a very critical year, 2012, uh, it's a critical year because um, that's when we started our own. We actually physically launched the socio-economic caste census. Eleven, it was for, meant for eleven, but we actually started work on the socio-economic caste census in 2012. That that year, we had 53 dollar billionaires. 2020, cusp of the lockdown. March 8th, 2020, um, we had $98 billionaires, okay? In the two years of the pandemic, we added, in the first year of the pandemic, we added more billionaires than in the preceding 10 years. We added 42 in the first year of the pandemic and 26 in the second year of the pandemic. Please note, this meant that 166 individuals accounted for about $800 billion, which at the time in March 2021 was about 27% of your gross domestic product. Bringing it to life that whole other meaning of gross. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the 
166 guys, sorry girls, it's mostly guys. There are a few token women in there. But uh, the, these 166, how do you calculate their percentage in the population? I did with the help of a very strong calculator. It is 0.000014% of the population were having wealth equivalent to about more than a quarter of your GDP. Hmm. Now, uh, the top 10 of those 166 made up the bulk of the amount. The top two, by the way, make up a fourth of the amount. You know, the, the usual suspects, Mukesh Bai and Gautam Ji. <laughs> the, uh, do you know that, please reflect for a moment that in 2021, the year 2021, the government of India told you that GDP shrank by 7.7%. That is the government estimate. There were others who had nastier things to say about it, but we won't go there. I mean, government of India tells us the truth. See, they're very objective and unbiased and everything else. So, yeah. So the, they said, now when the nation's economy tanked 7.7%, 166 individuals doubled their wealth. According to Forbes, 94% increase in the first year of the pandemic. Doubled their wealth in the first 12 months of the worst situation of hunger that India had seen since the late 1960s. Do you think that's fair? Yeah. Of course, it's un and the top five are, the richer, are richer than the next five, and the top ten are richer than a hell of a lot of people. Of course, it's a pure coincidence that the top five are all Gujaratis. They're very, they're very hardworking people, as we know. <laughs> Purely coincidence. Yeah, Ambari, Adani, Palanji, Sangvi, and uh, Premji. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we know they're very, very hardworking people. Right? And we've seen how hard Mr. Adani has worked in the last two years. Here, yeah. by the way, the promise of neoliberalism and capitalism in general is hard work and you can do it. Now, can I suggest to you that if hard work was to make you a billionaire, and others have made the suggestions before me, if hard work makes you a billionaire, every woman in rural India ought to be a billionaire. Every, every woman in rural and urban Africa ought to be a billionaire, right? So, but they aren't, right? I don't think all of you are. So, you're not working hard. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, the top two, did you, well, let's see how that affects coverage. How did it affect the farm protests? How does it affect the writing of your Azadi Ka Amrut Mahotsav? How does it affect all these things? In when the protests were on at the gates of Delhi, there were two names that came in almost every damn slogan the farmers shouted. Every second slogan, let us say. In Singhu, in Tikri, in uh, uh, Shah Jahanpur, where all three places I spent a lot of time. By the way, good journalism means spending time on your story. Okay? It means being, on the, being, on the, being in the field, on the spot, spending, your, spending time there. Now, every other slogan there, some of you I know visited Singhu or Tikri. Every other slogan said Ambani Adani. Do you know what your media did not tell you? Two things. One, the farm laws were not drafted in parliament. They never went to standing committee or agriculture. They were never presented to a special committee. They were drafted in corporate boardrooms by corporate lawyers. I hope all the lawyers feel very guilty. <laughs> you know what 
if you remember that was it richard the sixth the shakespeare where shakespeare's character duck the butcher there's a 15th century peasantry uprising in medieval england you know what his slogan was duck the first let us slay all the lawyers <laughs> yeah yeah let us kill all the lawyers that's it's man that's shakespeare not me here i need my lawyers especially in coming days <laughs> and yeah so the kind of stuff now mr why were the if you we did an analysis of editorials and opinion pieces in the media including in places full of journalism of courage and other things and uh, we uh, found that the ma main great newspapers all were sympathetic to the farmers up to the last paragraph of the editorial they said you know these are simple folk government is not talking to them properly you know these are yokels meeti baat karo you know talk to them sweetly they don't understand last paragraph of the editorial says but these are very good laws don't withdraw them because they're owned by the same people benefiting from the laws okay mr ambani why did you not read about that slogans that took ambani and adani's name in every um, meeting in every protest rally because mr ambani was not only the richest man in india since then before he descended into acute you know misery of second place uh, before that mr ambani was the rich not only the richest man in india he is the richest and biggest media owner in india and those media he does not own he is the biggest private advertiser we actually believe in that dictum that don't bite the hand that feeds you right now so the media were quiet on that and they did not tell you that at the time of march 2021 when the protests were really up there after five months of battle that mr ambani's personal wealth stated in the forbes of march 2020 or 2021 his personal wealth was equal to the gdp of punjab actually economists call it gsdp gross state domestic product his G his personal wealth so much of it as they were able to count was 84.5 billion dollars punjab's gdp was 85.5 billion dollars and sinking his was 84.5 billion dollars and rising at the rate of 129% a year over the previous year he had gained 129% Mr Adani's uh, wealth grew 467% according to Forbes and I believe Forbes you know <laughs> Stevens never told me a lie and uh, 467% increase in uh, in his personal wealth today uh, by the way in March 2021 the two of them combined accounted for 128 billion 127 billion US dollars today the two of them combined account for 228 US billion dollars in wealth boy what hard work can do <laughs> yeah so so this is that kind of in your azadi ka amrut mahotsav look at and look at what they have done with your freedom struggle your freedom struggle was about these issues it was about the loot it was about the loot um it was about the loot of a people of peoples of whole societies and nations it was about that but the website on your azadi ka amrut mahotsav does not have one paragraph on the inequities inequalities of british rule does not say anything about what british colonialism did to india which included 24 large famines 
culminating in the Bengal famine, which took at least 3 million lives. God knows how many millions dying in wars, pestilence, hunger. None of this. This was what your struggle was about. This is what your freedom fight was about. Okay? This is what it was about. That, but those of you who've gone to the website, have you seen a single photograph, video, audio, statement, article by a living freedom fighter on that website? Not one. Whose photographs did you see? <laughs> the reassuring face of, yeah. You can find them on your gas cylinders also. <laughs> and, yeah, so the, um, nowhere, in, so you had nothing about that inequality nothing about the murderous nature of colonialism. And we, we have lines there on the home page. We Indians are proud of our constitution. Yeah, that's very nice. It's good to know, even if we see you scuttling it every day in courts. But, but what is in it, what is it in the constitution that you are proud of? And I would say today, I mean, maybe I wouldn't have said this 25, 30 years ago, but I would say that Constitution of India is the finest distillation of the ideals, values of the freedom struggle. I would say that. Especially, I, know, I noticed that some of you wear t-shirts with the preamble and I'm very happy about that. But I'd just like to mention that there are a few more pages to the Constitution. You know, <laughs> and they're worth reading. They're worth reading. You know, another thing about being good journalists, read. It never killed anybody. I notice, I notice some faces are anxious when I said it never killed anybody. You're probably saying, I don't want to be the first. <laughs> but, but I guarantee or your money back. I don't know about your life back, but your money back. It won't kill you. Hmm. It, if you look at that, if you read that thing as I did painfully, it has a budget of 110 crores, that website, with related activities. The related activities are not organized at the money of the website. But it means that if a little girl in Tirnal Valley in a school sings one day matram, that is an event organized. And in this manner, they have lodged up 89,000 events organized, one every half hour in the year of 75th year of independence. What was that freedom struggle about? Hmm. And with all this, 12 days ago, you lower your flag at half-mast for the symbol of power that killed you. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you that, you know, there were two things, two incidents in history which you should know of. And I look, look at uh, before me, and I'm concerned for you because I see a generation that's being robbed of its history. I see a generation that's been having its history stolen. By the way, I was trained as a historian, not as a journalist. And, you know, ended up dabbling in both. But in, it's not as if the British, you know, developed a conscience and saw how good these Indians are with their Satyagraha and withdrew. Because they didn't withdraw from elsewhere. They went around killing thousands of other people in Africa, including 20,000 summary executions of Kenyans in their national uprising called the Mao Mao Uprising. Yeah? And please, 1952, when the first two, 3,000 of them were being executed in massacres, was when your Queen Elizabeth celebrated her honeymoon in Kenya in a treetop lodge called Treetops. Okay? In eight, switch back, 1876, I want every one of you to read a book called Late Victorian Holocausts by Mike Davis. The only book I've seen which details the incident I want to speak to you about, I realize I've got about 10 minutes, uh, but I really want to share this information and I'm going to even take my life in my hands and leave a little later because I want to talk to you. I've got this chance. And... Uh, 
The, do you know 1876, Victoria decided to promote herself. You see, when you're a queen, only you can promote yourself. There's no one, there is no CEO to promote you. So she, dis, she found herself in possession of a fairly large piece of real estate, which today we call India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and decided she would be queen of England, a small country, but empress of India. That was the title she gave herself. And we held a darbar in this country in 1876. 68,000 guests is the official number. And they're all royalty. So you see, uh, the means, each of those guests came with an entourage, right? They came with the palki bearers, the carriage drivers, the horses, the guys who cleaned the horse shit, all this stuff. So you had about a quarter, I mean my estimate, 68,000 is the number given of the guests, but my estimate is that it must have gathered about a quarter of a million people there. Victoria herself never attended. She felt that a long ocean journey would be too arduous. Mm. But she sent us a very sweet message about how under her rule, India was prospering and doing brilliantly. It was in fact 1876 to 1878, one of the great famines that took between eight and nine million lives. 100,000 lives in the week of the Darbar between just Madras and Mysore alone. And people were trying to storm the cities in hunger and police were clubbing them to death at the You'll find all this reported in the newspapers. You'll find the same newspapers covering the Darbar brilliantly, but they don't make a connection between the two. Huh? Between the famine, the Darbar, the greater, all. Guys, you paid for that party. It's the greatest party in history, greater than anything Nero organized in Rome. Yeah, and, but it remained a secret in the history books except for Mike Davis. And I believe Rajni Palme, that mentions the costs to the empire, the cost to the people. You look anywhere, even in an Eric Hobsbawm, you don't find that thing about the sheer incredible loss of lives and what it meant in the famine and the great Darbar alongside. Victoria's, Dar Victoria's Darbar and the attachment to the famine remains one of history's secrets. Let's call it Victoria's original secret. <laughs> yeah, so whether you're looking at the farm protests, whether you're looking at the pandemic, leave one more example on the pandemic. On March 31st, as millions of people were leaving the cities and going back to their villages, which I think was a very rational decision. They knew we weren't going to look after them, okay? But all our bleeding heart, why are they leaving? Wrong question. You should have been asking that question 20 years ago. Why did they leave their villages to come here? The answer was two words, agrarian crisis. But we didn't give a shit about that. So we never raised that, because we were getting our cheap malis, our cheap drivers, our cheap electricians, plumbers, naukaranis, all of them, we were getting that cheap. So we really were very concerned when they left. We were never bothered about, did we ever have a conversation with them about, why did you leave here and come? The woman who cleaned my apartment and about five others in our building was a skilled farmer from Talegaon near Pune. Every year she still sends us some brown, beautiful, high quality rice from her fields. Agriculture had collapsed. The great process of your time, the agrarian crisis, the, in, the incidence of 400,000 farmers taking their own lives. Yeah? Taking their own lives in distress and despair. The question was, why aren't they going back? The question was, what drove them to desperation to come here to work for you and me? I mean, we know we're all such charming people, so you can't not want to work for us. But what brought them here? Whether you look at the pandemic, whether you look at the... And then, on March 31st, as this mayhem was on, the, was it the Attorney General or the Solicitor General, I can never tell which, 
uh, Advocate General or the Solicitor General on March 31st told the Supreme Court of India, was it the, the on March 31st, the AG or SG hmm, told the Supreme Court of India, as of now, as of 11 a.m. March 31st, there is not a single person on the streets and the highways. A month later, two months later, the railways reported that they had ferried 9.1 million, 91 lakh people had been carried. On May 26th, and the railways reported that for the period May 1 to May 26, mind you. We are talking about 20, 30 million human beings moving. How, your Prime Minister made five speeches during the first three months of the pandemic. Four speeches, the first four never mentioned the word migrant laborers. Just like they never mentioned the word Safai Karamcharis and manual scavengers in the list of, in, in the list of heroes, frontline heroes. Yeah, it was ordinary people who did it. Hmm. Uh, I know we are clean out of time. I want to, this is where I get to plug my book, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I have a book coming on November 28th, for official release. I'm inviting you all of you for the release. It's, it's the multi-purpose hall at IIC, so you'll actually fit. And, uh, and uh, it's on the last heroes, the ordinary people who made your independence. Mahatma Gandhi in, March, in January 1931 wrote a letter to Prema by Kantak, who was praising him and other great men. Only Gandhi could write a one-liner like that on the back of a postcard. Great men seem to make revolutions. In truth, people are the cause. Great, great men seem to be the cause of revolutions. In truth, people are the cause. Yeah? The kind of people, I'm just going to end with showing you a three minute clip of one of the kind of people who did it, because the book is full of very diverse characters. And it's not those who went to, Ox, uh, you know, it's not the Oxbridge Brahmin Baniya elite. Hmm. These are very ordinary people. And one of them, Mallu Swarajyam, was a person who, uh, one of them, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm ready, I can do it. Yeah, I'm not yet clicking. You tell me when I'll click. Hmm. Yeah, please share. Mallu Swarajyam started fighting the Nizam Razakars at age 13 with a slingshot. Hmm? Yeah, get there, but don't yeah, share it with them. And they killed people with slingshots. By the way, it's the only weapon that many Palestinians have today on the West Bank to fight Israeli defense forces. <laughs> and now I was interviewing her for 1,500 young techies. And I had to ask her dumb questions, which is a very dangerous thing with Malu Swarajam. She has horrible temper. Hmm? And would let me have it on stage, really, really. I mean, but I had to ask her because there were young people sitting there who didn't know. I had to ask her, Swarajam Garu, there were 1,500 techies from the software company called ThoughtWorks. They're away day. I asked her, yeah, all this is very fine. I know slingshots are still used by the Irulas to kill birds and rabbits and boars, but are slingshots actually useful in close-in combat? And she got mad. <laughs> you know what she did? All huge. This is the Marriott Auditorium in Hyderabad. She whips out a slingshot. She is 84 years old at that time. She died at 92 this March and showed how it was done. <laughs> Would you like to see? She got mad. And then she, she brought along that and she brought along a cricket ball to be the weapon. Then she saw the young frightened faces and said, removed the ball from the slingshot and said, okay, I won't use the actual weapon because I don't want to hurt you guys. But it's what she said at the end of it. I'm going to show you only a few seconds of the... What was the 
ಸಾ ತಿಪ್ಪಿ 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 ಕಾಟೆ ಪೊಲೀಸರು ಆನಾಡು ನಾಲ್ಗು ವೇಲ ಮಂದಿ ಅಮರುಲೈನ ಸಾಮಾನ್ಯವೈನಟ್ವಂಟಿ ರೈತಲು ಅರಿಜನ ಗಿರಿಜನ ಜನ ಮಾ ಕಳ್ಳ ಮುಂದೆ ಪ್ರಾಣಾಲ ನರ್ಪಿಂಚಿ ಪೋರಾಡ್ತು ಉಂಟೆ ಆ ಪೋರಾಟಲ್ಲು ತುಪಾಕಳು ಅಂದುಕೊನಿ ರಾಳ್ಳು ಅಂದುಕೊನಿ ಒಡಿಸಾಲ ತೀಸ್ಕೊತಿನ ಚೂಪಿಸಡಾನಿಕಿ ಮಿಕು ಆಡವಾಳ್ಳು ಮಗವಾಳ್ಳು ಆ ಕ್ಯೂಡಲಿ ದಾನಿಕಿ ಬೆತ್ರೇಕಂಗಾ ಊರುಕು ಊರು ಏಕಮೈ ಗಡಿಲ ಮೀದಾ ಇಲಾಂತೆ ಒಡಿಸಾಲಲೋ ಕ ರಾಯಿಂದಲೋ ಬಾಲುಂದಿ ಬಹುಶಃ ಈ ಬಾಲ್ ಕೂಡ ಗಟ್ಟಿಗೆನೆ ಒಂದು ಮೀ ದಗರ್ ಕೊಸ್ತು ದೆಬ್ಬದಾಗ್ತದೆ ಅಂದ್ಕೊಂಡು ಇದು ಹೇಳಿ ಬೆಳೆತು ನಾನೆ ಓದು ಓದು ದೆಬ್ಬದಾಗ್ತದೆ ಏನೇನು ಬಟ್ಕೊನಿ ತಿಪ್ಪಿ 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 ಕಾಟೆ ಪೊಲೀಸರು ಅಟ್ ಏಜ್ ತರ್ಟೀನ್ ಶಿ ವಾಸ್ ಫೈಟಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ಸ್ಲಿಂಗ್ ಶಾಟ್ ಅಟ್ ಏಜ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನ್ ಶಿ ವಾಸ್ ದ ಲೀಡರ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ದಲಮ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಅಪ್ರೈಸಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ north varangal which was one of the main but meaning male female dalams everybody she was the leader with a rifle remember for a 16 year old girl to be made the leader that sort of a fighter she was and maybe there is even a photo of her in in that battle get up which you can see i'm just pulling it through the nizam placed a bounty on her head personally of 10000 rupees you know what 10000 rupees was in 1946 83000 kilograms of rice these were the sort of people there was captain bhav you'll find him you know one thing in the book this time we have done a very unusual thing at the end of each chapter there is a qr code which will take you to the people's archive of rural india video photo gallery where you can see their videos hmm? most of them never had photographs from the 20s 30s and 40s because they were from very poor families but we have later pictures of them including her wielding a rifle in the telangana uprising you know in this was me to go na allo i feel you to hold and give and like that what if that they you know here we are standing in the line to pay obeisance to queen elizabeth here were these people who were fighting for your independence and freedom as captain bow said it we fought for two things we fought for freedom we fought for independence we attained independence hmm. and i went to college in a time when we still read about in school when we still read about the british uh, you know sun never sets on the british empire we had vincent smith as a textbook till the 70s in madras university now i belong to a tradition which followed the irish version of the sun never sets on the british empire <laughs> which was the sun never sets on the british empire because even god can't trust those bastards in the dark Uh, with it. the flag coat oh, yeah. to express our gratitude to the speaker it took so many years for me to listen to him in person but i'm so glad for you that this afternoon at such an early stage you got an opportunity to listen to him two quick points if we could uh, sort of consider some takeaways from mr sainath's life and experiences one is the duty to care and the empathy that we expect you to imbibe as students of journalism and the other one is to become master story tellers you need a certain epistemology you need a certain pedagogy and that's what you are going to get here not only from your school in particular but the diversity the multitude of all other uh, disciplines and schools that we have and we want you to maximize on the opportunities that you are going to be getting and being a university student is a huge privilege so i would personally and even otherwise on behalf of the university appeal to each one of you to respect the heterogeneity that we have the diversity that we have and ensure that 
you are abiding by the code of conduct at all times so that you have a very harmonious sort of three years during your stay here at the school and I wish you all a very enriching semester and term time ahead. But uh, thanks to the Dean Kishalai and his team members and all the faculty members for curating this and making this afternoon a possibility. And thanks to all the faculty members uh, from va various other schools of the university uh, for having taken time out to attend this lecture. In particular, I acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, Professor Chimney, Professor Sukumar, and so many others uh, whose names probably I have not taken. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a very enchanting afternoon. And uh, I wish you all the very best once again. And thanks to you, Mr. Sainad. Uh, for engaging with all of us.